Peace and blessings, y'all. This is Chapter 3, True to the Game by Terry Woods. If you like what you hear, subscribe, comment, like, share with a friend, and all that good stuff. First date. Kwadir knew exactly where to go. He drove over to Atlantic City. After buying everyone back in Philly a pair of Gucci sneakers, they gambled. Sahara lost every bit of the $550 Rasson had slowly given her. Gina, on the other hand, was doing mighty well, taking a $1,000 Kwadir handed her and winning, winning, winning. She ended up with close to $4,000 by the time the night was over at the blackjack table. Later, they took the escalator up to the third level, where there were several restaurants to choose from. Once they were seated, Kwadir told Rasson about his little running with Jarrell Jackson. Rasson didn't like nothing about the junior mafia. Kwadir, don't mess with him. He wants to be Scarface, own the fucking world and shit. He's the type that will stab you in the back. Don't fuck with him, Kwa. Ak, that will never happen. Gina was curious. Who are y'all talking about? Man talk, Kwadir said. Nobody you know anyway. I know who you talking about, says Sahara. Rasson jumped in, trying to shut her up. You don't know nothing. Yes, I do. You were talking about Jarrell Jackson. Gina brightened up a little bit. Oh, yeah, I heard about him. Isn't he supposed to be the leader of Junior Mafia or something? Yes, says Sahara. Really? Gina turned to Quadir. How do you know him? What difference does it make? He isn't the mob. Sahara went and stopped. He's the leader of the Junior Mafia. It is the mob, okay? Rasson spoke up. Well, how do you know him? Sahara warmed to her gossip. One night, I was with my girlfriend. She was going out with him a lot. Anyway, he gave us a ride back to her house. Kwa didn't like her no more. And he didn't believe one word she said. The girl might have been telling the truth, but nine chances out of ten... The bitch was lying through her teeth. He threw some money on the table and got up. Let's go, Gina. You know how to drive? Yes. He handed her the valet stub. Gently, she pulled Sahara over to her and hissed through her teeth. You talk too much. The drive home seemed to take forever. Everyone had fallen asleep, and Gina had no one to talk to. She reached over and rubbed Quadir's leg. He opened one eye and squeezed her hand. You still want to go away? Gina wasn't sure she was hearing what she was saying. Isn't nothing going to happen to me, is it? Woman to her childlike fear, he told her, Baby doll, I wouldn't let anything happen to you. I'll protect you from all harm, he said, as he winked at her. Gina pulled up outside Rasson's house and dropped Rasson and Sahara off. When they were alone in the car, he asked, What time will you be ready tomorrow? Ready? Where we going? I don't know. Let's go to the Bahamas. Are you serious? Yes, I am. Gina just stared at him. She remembered how anxious Jamal was when they first met. Then she wondered, should she just leave town with Quadir? What if something happened to her? What if he was just as crazy and deranged as Jamal? She looked into his eyes and didn't have a clue. He could be a rapist, but she already had made up her mind. If he wanted to take her to the Bahamas, then she was going. She turned on Chancellor Street, pulled up to the front door. Five o'clock. I'll be back at five, he said. I'll be ready, she said, real serious. So, I'll see you later. Later. Gina just sat there looking at him. For some strange reason, she couldn't get out the car. Something was holding her. She didn't know what it was until he reached over, put his arm around her neck. He pulled her closer to him and kissed her. At first, he just touched her lips with his lightly. Then, he opened his mouth with his tongue and gently probed. Confusion and heat filled her like nothing she's ever felt before. Like magnets drawn to one another. It was magic. Our first kiss, Gina thought. In the safety of her apartment, Sahara was right. Quadir Richards is the man of life. The next morning... She had so much to do, shopping, hair, nails, packing, and that was only the beginning. The phone pulled her out of her trance. Gina, it's Jamal. 
Oh, hi. Ice crept into her veins. You all right? I'm okay. How are you? I don't feel good. I have a sore throat and a fever. Have you been to the doctor? She asked him. No, I'm not going to no doctor. Well, I hope you feel better. Are you going to come over to take care of me? She could hear the faint hope in his voice, thinking to herself, Hell no, bitch. Die. With satisfaction, she informed him. Jamal, I can't. I have to go to the beauty salon and get my hair done. Well, what about after you go and get your hair done? After that, I have to go to the mall and pick up a few things. And I have to get my nails done. You know what? I think I'll get my feet done too. So I don't think I have time to come over there. I have a very busy day. Jamal felt like he was getting the brush off and he didn't like it. Not one bit. Everything he had done for her meant nothing. He could die and it wouldn't mean anything to her. Well, Gina, I can tell when I'm not wanted. Jamal, why do you say it like that? I thought we understood that it wasn't working when you beat me up. Gina, you always going to be mine. What do you mean when you say it isn't working? Is he brain dead? Gina thought to herself. Jamal, I can't come and see you. I'm confused. I need some time. I want us to just be friends. Fuck you. All you bitches are the same. You ain't shit, shouted Jamal. With enough serene confidence to make his brain explode, she continued, See, that is the very reason right there why we are not together. Everything is my fault, right? You're the one who wants to be at every party on the East Coast. You're the one who stays out all night with other niggas. Yes, you do. Don't lie, Gina. Tell the truth. For once, be truthful. You and that Sahara bitch stay out in the street all night chasing behind niggas. I know what you do. You don't fool me. Jamal, first of all, let me tell you something, okay? I don't chase behind nobody. I get chased. And I am not out in no street all hours of the night either. He cut her off and really let her have it. He accused her of everything underneath the sun, saying incredibly hurtful things. She found a wellspring of understanding that told her it was just because he was hurting. If the things he was saying were true, it would cut her real deep. But what he was saying made her mad. Jamal had lost his mind, calling her with a whole bunch of bullshit. She hung the phone up. That was it. Conversation over. And when he called back, she turned off the ringer. She wasn't about to listen to any more of his threats and accusations. Quadel was down in North Philly collecting the money everyone owed him. He went to the house where Gina had dropped off Sahara and Rasson. Rasson and Sahara were in a good sleep when Qua woke them up, knocking at the bedroom door. What happened to your hair, Sahara? Qua asked her as she brushed by him going into the bathroom. Ask your friend, she spat back at him. Nasty little thing, ain't she? Yeah, she's not a happy camper. Ra grinned and gave Sahara another 300, but she continued to grouse when Kwa told her she would have to catch a cab home. Kwa then Rasan cut through the park in West Philly to see Miss Shug. Miss Shug was a little elderly lady he did business with. Shug was something else. Back in her day, she ran a speakeasy in a gambling spot. She even ran a numbers game. Shug had it all. All the men raved about her. She could have had her pick of any of them, but chose none. By the time she was ready to choose, she had so many kids by so many different men, and the streets had beat her up so bad, she was considered not the marrying type. Shug was a hell of a woman, though. Quadir listened to everything she said. He might not follow her instructions, but he listened. He knocked at the door. One of Shug's granddaughters let him in. She had so many grandchildren. There must have been at least 15 people living in a three-story row home on the narrow one-way street of the 2200 block of Bouvier Street. Entering the kitchen, he placed a bag holding a quarter kilo of cocaine on the table. I need you to cook this up for me, Miss Shug. Fool, you always needed something. The only time you come to see Shug is when you need something, she said, pointing her finger at him. I got the family coming over today. I got enough cooking around here to do already. She could cook her ass off. She used to cook and sell platters when she was running her speakeasy back in the day. Those niggas used to pay me to cook their food for them. Are you going to pay me to cook this shit for you? Don't I always pay you? Quadair considered. 
for a moment, this woman he'd come to count on and saw that once proud and sassy woman had slowed under the burden she carried for so many decades of doing for others. Come on, baby, what's the matter? Everything, she said. What? He softly touched her shoulders and sat her down at her own table. A barely discernible squeeze and a touch to her cheek brought a sad smile. It seems like you just don't be getting too far out here in life, Quade. You do what you gotta do to survive out here. You try your damnness to see that there's some food on the table and clothes for the kids, and they don't get you nowhere. Badass motherfuckers around here now don't listen. I done brought minds into this world. These ain't minds. They killing me, Quade. Sure as there's a god in the sky, these badass kids is gonna be the death of me. Eight damn kids that ain't mine. And here, look at this. Miss Shug put out a paper from her apron and handed it to Quade, hoping that her scam would work. Miss Shug always had a scam. What is it? It's a get the fuck out notice. I've been paying the mortgage on this house now for 27 years. I only got three more to go than the house is mine. After all this time, you'd think they couldn't do this. Her face began to crumble. How much do you need, said Quade, locating the total due on the paper. Oh, damn, Shug, you had me worried. That's all you need? I got that for you, baby. Calm down. Quade, stop your line. You hardly pay me when I cook this shit up for you. So I know your black ass ain't gonna pay all that. She looked at Quad as if he would she looked at Quad as if it was all his fault. The truth of the matter was that Quad always paid Suge whatever she wanted. The price wasn't always the same, but Suge got paid. He would even stop by to see how she was doing and not ask her to do nothing for him. The bottom line was everybody wanted something. Everybody had a story. Quad separated the two. He was always gonna look out for her. It was just the right thing to do. Cook my shit up, Suge. He said as he went outside. He came back in and handed her a bag of money. Shook snickered on the inside, but on the outside showed a look of gratefulness Quadia had never seen. There, that would save your house. Shook couldn't believe it. It worked. It was as if the Lord blessed somebody else and they passed it on to her. She could barely whisper her thanks. That's going to be more than enough, Quadia. Qua was glad to bring hope to someone who deserved it. Here, get yourself something and get something for the kids. He pulled out a wad of money from his pocket, peeling back a couple hundred dollar bills. Qua had money all over him. I don't mean to fuss at you, baby, she said, changing everything up. You're the only one that understands. Oh, Qua, I wish that damn John John had turned out like you, she said, now standing up and reaching for an empty mayonnaise jar, going about the business she was in. She took the cocaine and mixed it with baking soda. She poured the combination into the mayonnaise jar and added the right amount of water, cooking batches at a time. Suge knew what she was doing, too. Gina got dressed and called a cab, going straight to Le Chevy Beauty Salon in South Philly. Hi, Gina, said one of the girls who worked there. Everyone knew her. She saw Beverly, her stylist. What's up, Bev? Yo, G. Bev smiled. Where you been? Nowhere, trying to get my life on. Guess who's pregnant by Rick, Beverly said. Who? I'm not going to tell you. I know how you run your mouth. Who? I won't tell. Veronica. He been fucking with her? Gina said, turning her face all up. Girl, she said she told him she was pregnant and Mr. Rick ain't called her back since. What? Gina couldn't believe it. I'm telling you, shit is crazy. Beverly finished the girl who was in the chair and took Gina over to the bowl, talking about everybody under the sun. Gina told her how she had been up at the fast food place when the three guys died. She didn't say nothing about the guy driving the caddy. Nothing said in the beauty salon is sacred. Everybody knows your business as it is. Gina didn't tell no secrets, but she stayed to gossip. Well, you know I don't fuck with Jamal no more. Why? It just wasn't working, Bev. I care about him, but... I can't see myself being with him. Well, damn, you don't seem too sad about it. I'm not. It's for the best. Girl, I don't believe you're letting Jamal go. He treated you real good. Money can't buy love. Hell, it could buy mine, said Bev. Mine too, said the girl sitting under the bowl beside Gina. Shit, 
He didn't try to take nothing back, did he? Beverly asked. No, but if he wants his shit back, he can have it, said Gina. I wouldn't give him back nothing, said Bev. Neither would I, honey. Keep your shit. Don't give that nigga a damn thing back, said the girl sitting under the next bowl. Gina and Beverly just stared at the girl for a few seconds. And when Beverly finished washing Gina's hair, they went to her station. Gina couldn't wait to let go the good shit. I met this guy, though, she said. Who? asked Bev. His name is Quadir. Quadir? Quadir from North with the BMW? asked Bev. Yeah, you know him? Yeah, he's supposed to be fucking with Dawn's sister, Sherelle. He give her anything? asked Gina. I don't think so. He probably got her a pair of sneakers and shit, but he ain't throw that shit to her like Jamal threw it to you. Because if he did, she would be up in here running her mouth about it. What she look like? Gina wanted to know. She don't look like nothing. She your average light-skinned bitch, said Bev, admiring Gina's chocolate skin tone. She don't look better than me, do she? Gina asked. Hell no, girl. Quade ain't no joke. The boy is large as hell. Jamal ain't never seen no money compared to that motherfucker. Girl, Quadir middle name is Stock and you will want to invest, said Bev. Guess what? What? I met him Wednesday in New York. Last night we went to Atlantic City and today he's taking me to the Bahamas. Beverly put the curling iron down. Bitch lies. No, I'm dead serious. So, Sherelle can forget about him because I'm getting ready to put my thing down. I guess he just playing Sherelle. I guess so, said Gina. Damn, she act like she was really in love with him too, said Bev. She'll get over it. That's the way love goes, said Gina with extreme confidence. So you just dropped Jamal when you started fucking with Kwa? No, I met Kwa there after me and Jamal had broke up. Here, said Beverly, handing her the hand mirror so she could see the back of her hair. Gina got a pump with a long strand of hair hanging down the side of her face. So when are you leaving? In a couple of hours. I have to go shopping, buy some luggage, and I have to get my nails done. I know you're happy, said Bev. I am. It's something about him, she said. Yeah, the man is rich, said Bev. No, it's not that. It's the way he looks at me and the way he talks to me, you know? Like we're on the same vibe. It seems like he's always been there watching me. Gina sat there with a gleam in her eyes, talking about the man, while Beverly wished it was her. I gotta go, Bev. I gotta go meet Sahara. We're going shopping. Gina got bathing suits, fashion accessories, short sets, summer dresses, and luggage. Then the girls went to a nice new nail salon on Lancaster Avenue. Pam was booked, but acted like Gina had an appointment and squeezed her in. Sahara and Gina sat in the nail salon talking about Quadir and how nice he was, especially since Jamal was so mean. I'll be glad when someone comes along for me, Sahara said. Sahara, you gotta settle down with somebody. That's what you gotta do. I know they a pain in the ass, but it's like a job. Besides, niggas sweat you half to death when you got a man. You stay single too long, the niggas gonna think that there's something wrong with you. Everybody gonna do their thing. You dig me? It's all about respect. I would have been the lowest bitch on the planet if I had taken them guys up on their propositions. But since I didn't, I showed loyalty to Jamal when I was with him. Girl, all them niggas think I'm a saint. You gotta prove that you're a woman enough to be true to your man. That's all you gotta do. You're not gonna get no respect dealing with a brother on that wham bam thank you here you go ma'am tip. You need to know that the brother got your best interest at heart. Money don't mean he care. You can't run tricks on the big boys. Tricks are for kids. So you just chill. Slow down baby. You moving kind of fast that's all. Sahara just sat there looking at her friend knowing what she was saying was true. But she was having fun and just couldn't see herself with no one man. Gina finished the last coat of paint on her fingernails. Oh, guess what? What? Guess who the fuck is pregnant by Rick? Who? Veronica. That slut. He went up in her ass raw? What he on? Rick better check himself. I'm saying though, don't he fuck with some girl named Lita? You know, I think he does. It probably ain't his said Sahara. She probably don't know who the father is. That bitch is nothing but a whore, Sahara bristled with righteousness. You don't like that girl because of Troy. I don't like the bitch because she always up in your man's face. Watch, 
I bet the bitch will be fucking Jamal in a minute. Gina sat on the side wall until her nails dried, talking to Sahara. The girls were like sisters. Sahara really didn't want Gina to go, but Sahara really didn't want Gina to go, but she couldn't tell her not to. Gina would be alright. Sahara knew that. She was gonna miss her friend. How long you guys gonna be there? A week or two. Send me a postcard? I'll do better than that. I'll bring you back something, smiled Gina. Sahara helped her get outside with her bags. A cab pulled over, and an Israeli gentleman stepped out of the car to help Gina with her bags. Being as though Sahara had lost her money in Atlantic City, Gina slipped her $300 in the palm of her hand. Sahara took Gina around her neck and gave her a hug. The girls kissed cheeks and let each other go. All right, I'm out. I'll see you when I get back. Sahara waved by and went back into the nail salon as the cab pulled away from the curb. If you want to hear more, subscribe, like, comment, all that good stuff.